Hi everyone, and welcome to our Brown Bag Lunch speaker series, brought to you by our wonderful members and their generosity. I'm Dia Nagaraj, the Associate Curator of Exhibitions at the Museum of Danish America, and I'm really excited today because we are joined by Leo Landis, who is the State Curator at the State Historical Society of Iowa. As some of you may know, this year marks the 175th anniversary of Iowa's statehood. And so uh, Leo is joining us today to talk a little bit more about that and what that means. So without further ado, I will turn it over to him. Enjoy. Well, thank you so much, Dia. And thank you also to Tova Brandt, who is a good friend of the State Historical Society of Iowa, as our everyone on staff at Museum of Danish America. And so it's a real treat to be talking to you today about our commemoration of Iowa statehood for the 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood. Uh, we'll talk mostly about a museum exhibit, but I also wanna say thanks for, uh, uh, to everyone at Museum of Danish America for uh, ordering one of the pop-up displays to have at, at the museum. So if you can't make it over to Des Moines, at least the very annotated version or abbreviated version uh, in about five and a half feet in height and uh, four feet wide or so, uh, four-sided pop-up display is at the Museum of Danish America. So thank you also to Tova and Dia and everyone at the Museum of Danish America for supporting the commemoration that way. When we launched our commemoration of Iowa statehood for the museum, we had known that we were ready to launch our mobile museum and the Winnebago RV that had been out in 2017, 2018, and 2019, and had created an exhibit called Iowa's People and Places for the Mobile Museum, and thought it translated well into an exhibit to commemorate Iowa's 175th anniversary of statehood. And so if you were to come to the State Historical Building, 600 East Locust, just west of the state capitol, currently we are open uh, from 9 to 4.30, Tuesdays through Fridays, and the best way to make sure our current hours is just to go to iowaculture.gov and, and check the museum hours. But we thought the Iowa's People and Places exhibit translated well to uh, telling stories that connected Iowans to state history and to commemorate the 175th anniversary of statehood. And the opening panel for the exhibit features two images. The larger image, the map that is my background, but also the main image on the panel is a 1934 map done by an Iowa City artist, Mildred Pelzer. And she actually had come up with the idea of doing an artistic rendering of Iowa historical events as both Dubuque and Burlington were approaching the centennial of their being cities. And so she was thinking about that in 1932 and 1933. And then as the territorial centennial was approaching, in 1938 decided to do her own map with uh, Iowa events. And I'll show you a few of those in a second. Then just wanna point out the map on the, or the image, excuse me, on the lower half of the panel is uh, the state capital at the time was in Iowa City, 1854. And this is the Johnson County Fair of 1854. So uh, great image, a daguerreotype, which is a early photographic type of process. It was done on a polished silver plate that had chemicals on it and was then exposed to light. And so the earliest really effective uh, system of image reproduction. And it's an image that's held in our Iowa City Research Center and just one of the, the most fantastic early images of our state in, in the daguerreotype process. And so you see the state capitol building and people uh, milling about an ox cart with a wagon full of watermelon is in the foreground. Uh, the state capitol is in the, the back center there, what is today known as the old capital, uh, people with horses. And so uh, giving you a little bit better view of the Pelzer map though, uh, I brought up a highlight of the Western section. And so in the lower center is Audubon County and uh, a little bit to the uh, west of that, though I think I cut off the notation, is Shelby County. And then also uh, some of the highlights that took place in, in those different communities, at least from the work Mildred Pelzer did. 
Her husband was a University of Iowa professor of history, so she had that perspective. And she also consulted other people across the state, uh, including members of the uh, leaders in the State Historical Society of Iowa that was then based only in Iowa City. So a nice little view, you've got uh, the State College of Agriculture over on the far right. So for Ames, uh, you've got a little bit of the State Capitol building in the lower right corner. Uh, different expeditions, uh, the section toward the west on Denison talks about uh, Leslie M. Shaw, who was the Secretary of Treasury and the uh, Theodore Roosevelt administration. So some of those highlights, mostly men's history, but there's actually some good women's history. And there is a, a reference to some of the Underground Railroad history. So it's a, a really interesting look at how one person using her influence chose to commemorate Iowa history. It's a poster that's about 40 inches by 28 inches. And we have copies of the original poster, both in Des Moines and in Iowa City. It was my colleague, Mary Bennett in Iowa City, who let me know about this poster. And we thought it was a good way to talk about Iowa history and what's been left out as well. Uh, and maybe we'll uh, reference some of that as we get into some of the stories we wanted to tell. The exhibit itself is uh, laid out in a chronological fashion using six eras of Iowa history. So talking about first peoples, and of course, uh, there are still uh, indigenous people who live in Iowa, the Meskwaki have a uh, settlement over in Tama County. Then a period called Becoming Americans that runs from 1803 to 1868, statewide settlement, talking about how more, especially Northwest Iowa, the development of communities there was disrupted by the Civil War. And so you don't really see larger towns developing in Northwest Iowa until after the Civil War. Then moving into the 20th century, using that as a framing device for that period from 1897 to 1963. Then a period we chose to call optimism and crisis that covers 1964 to 1986. And then the last one uh, covers 1987 to the present. And that framework is one that was developed through a teaching Iowa History Advisory Council or an Iowa History Advisory Council. Um, it was slightly different than that, but we thought it was a good framework to design our exhibit. That first panel and the way I'll approach this is talk a little bit about some of the images that are on the main panel and then choose an artifact or two to highlight and talk about how that fits into the themes. And the themes in that first section, uh, besides talking about native peoples in general, uh, discuss the Meskwaki Nation, particularly uh, mining, which actually goes back to Iowa's native peoples, the Meskwaki and other nations where mining led in Iowa long before Julian Dubuque uh, came around. And in fact, it was the Meskwaki that Dubuque, uh, besides the Spanish, asked for permission to engage in his mining activities in the late 18th century, late 1790s. So, uh, that's one of the themes. And then trade as a theme as well is one we address in that section. The images that we highlighted are actually three Ho-Chunk women. That's the larger image. And they're in traditional dress. It's an image from about the year 1900. So they're in long dresses with uh, shell or other material necklaces. The capes that they have on are adorned in German silver. And the photograph was actually taken in Tama County as these women were presumably visiting the either Meskwaki powwow or just visiting the Meskwaki settlement in general in the late 1890s, early 1900s. So a, a really excellent image of three Winnebago or Ho-Chunk women. And then the lower image, the color image is an Iowa chief, the nation that our state takes its name. Uh, his name is Wachamane. Uh, and we had that image and certainly wanted to recognize and acknowledge the Iowa people as having uh, generations of history in the state that we now know as Iowa. And the maps that are there talk about some of the lead mining in the Iowa Native nations also. Then the artifact that I wanted to highlight in this section is two pieces of paper that were at one time joined using uh, red wax. That's the red dots that you see on the lower image at its top. And so these are two sheets of paper that are about 11 inches by 17 inches wide. So together it's about two feet tall and 17 inches wide. 
And it was drawn by a Meskwaki man, a Meskwaki elder named Wako Shashi. He lived from the late 1790s into the, uh, or I should say the late 1700s into the uh, 1830s, 1840s. And we think he did this drawing for the Euro-American uh, resident, George Davenport. It came to us probably in the early 20th century from an acquisition from the Davenport family. And it shows animals that were sacred and part of the cosmology for the Meskwaki people, but also shows the, a couple of important events or a, a handful of important events for Wakashashi. So in the upper left of the uh, top image is a bison hunt where two men are on horseback and they're shooting a bison. But just below that, almost in the center is a small battle scene where Wakashashi is presumably the man crouched behind what is a sketch of a tree and shooting uh, an enemy. And this is all pen and ink drawing. So it's a really significant piece. You just do not see drawings like this by native peoples very often prior to the year 1840. And as I said, we, we believe this one is from about 1830. And so a really significant drawing about the important events personally to Wakashashi, but also uh, about some of the belief systems for the Meskwaki people. The lower half uh, is mostly mammals and some birds and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a few reptiles as well. In the kind of upper uh, left quadrant, uh, there's a what may be a, a crane. And then next to that is a, a couple of snapping turtles. And so you see uh, different animals. The upper one mostly represents fishes, though some mammals and a few birds as well. And there's another battle scene where Wakashashi on that lower half, and this is mostly in the uh, right center uh, upper half of the drawing is uh, again get engaged in a battle and uh, drawing power from the animals. And, and you can also see in that drawing there's a, a beaver with its uh, kind of paddle tail that's in a trap in the center of the image. So really representing a broad range of animals that were important to the Meskwaki people. And as I said, when you want to talk about significant collections or significant drawings, uh, this piece has been exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum. So it, it has a uh, really significant history. And in fact, if you Google Wakashashi uh, drawing, the Met has this on their site. They do give us credit for it being in our collection, but it almost leads you to believe that's in the Metropolitan Museum's collection as opposed to ours. So if you ever see it online, know that you as an Iowan own this really significant piece uh, that we are the stewards of it at the State Historical Museum, but it's part of your collection as an Iowan, and a really important piece. The Becoming American section then addresses how what is Iowa became part of the United States. And so the Louisiana Purchase, of course, and then the influence of religion in the early territorial period into the uh, beginnings of statehood is a topic we address. And we also discuss the Civil War. And in this section, I'll talk about a couple of different artifacts. And I'll sometimes be a little superficial. If you want to learn more, uh, please do come see the exhibit. But uh, the first piece we'll highlight is a Bible that was used by a family that had immigrated from the Netherlands, and they did come to Marion County and also Jasper County in central Iowa, so part of the community that developed around Pella and on the, uh, in the countryside around Pella. And the Van Wyck family uh, presumably had owned this Bible. It was printed in the 1670s, so it's all in Dutch. And uh, was one that was brought then from the Netherlands to Iowa as part of what was important to their families. They left their home country and decided to create a new life in uh, the United States. And Dorothy Schweder, who is now deceased, but was the preeminent Iowa historian of the uh, 19, late 1970s into the 2000s. Uh, I had her as a grad school professor and she really emphasized to us the role of religion in the Midwest and how religion and faith traditions shaped our communities in Iowa. And that's something I put a lot of stock in that as a interpretive theme. And so really wanted to talk about how Iowa communities 
uh, developed around religion and that we've had a wide range of religions in our state from uh, early territorial or early statehood days. The uh, first Jewish uh, congregation develops around Dubuque in the 1850s. And so we talk about that story in the museum exhibit, but really an important set of stories to highlight. And then the other piece that uh, wanted to talk about how our state has shaped and lived up to the ideals of the United States what is a flag that was carried by black soldiers from Iowa, or at least representing Iowa, in the Civil War. And it's the flag for the first colored regiment of Iowa. These were men who, uh, some of them had children going to segregated schools in Iowa. Uh, some of them uh, had been enslaved or were enslaved in Missouri. So um, uh, regiments, about a thousand men, there were about uh, 250, 260 that were actually from Missouri, and we presume a number of those men were enslaved and uh, sought their freedom and then chose to fight on behalf of Iowa. And so even though Blacks couldn't vote in our state, uh, they thought the Union cause was worth fighting for and that the ideals that the United States founded on was something that they thought was important and so chose to fight on behalf of the First Colored Regiment of Iowa. And black women from Keokuk and Muscatine made this flag for the regiment. And so it was uh, carried by the men who served from the 1860s into 1865, 1863 uh, with the Emancipation Proclamations when blacks were allowed to serve in regiments. Uh, uh, legally by United States federal guidelines. And so uh, they were mostly organized in the summer and fall of 1863. And then by the summer of 1864, uh, actually were engaged in the Battle of Wallace's Ferry in Arkansas. Uh, one of their white commanders, uh, when asked about, you know, are they suitable soldiers? Soldiers said, and I'm paraphrasing, if anyone has any doubts about whether the black man can fight, look at the first colored regiment of Iowa. So these men fought bravely, bravely and honorably. Some were killed in battle and uh, really a privilege to be able to have this flag to share our state's history and our nation's history and have it on display in the Iowa's People and Places exhibit. Statewide settlement, we talk about migration and immigration and railroads, the social movement, the Chautauquas, that was a, both a self-improvement and an entertaining uh, event that communities across our state hosted in the late uh, 1800s and into the early 20th century, actually. And then the populist movement as well, that uh, was part of the political and social environment of the post-Civil War period in Iowa. And in the statewide settlement uh, section, we chose to highlight a quilt from Hamilton County, which is Webster City, so just a little north of Des Moines, uh, just to the west of I-80, excuse me, I-35, uh, headed up toward Mason City. And uh, family with Swedish ancestry had <clears throat> lived in Hamilton County and acquired this quilt, uh, probably contributed a block. There are a hundred total blocks and each block has around seven or eight names, some more. And so the Anderson family uh, that was connected to this quilt, some descendants uh, donated it to us actually in early 2020, uh, shortly after the pandemic was changing things. So it was the, uh, one of the er early and only things I uh, met somebody in person for. And, uh, May or April of 2020, but it really is a great representation of uh, families in Webster City and in Jewell, Iowa area, uh, and the uh, Williams, Iowa area as well. So uh, a really good example, families from Eastern states as well as immigrant families are represented on this quilt and how our state was shaped that way and, and a really important story. Then in the section that deals with the early or the first two thirds almost of the 20th century, you know that's a lot to try to cover, uh, but that first section we covered uh, over uh, 10,000 years of Iowa history in one panel. So I think it's okay to do about 65 years of Iowa history in one panel and US history. And on this section, we chose to address African-American families, women's suffrage, uh, the two world wars, the Great Depression, and then the Cold War. And 
the artifacts that we highlighted here, we have uh, NAACP charter for the Des Moines NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. That was our state's first NAACP chapter. We also have an honor roll from black soldiers who served in World War I. A trophy that was awarded by the Wallace family. So from both Adair and Polk County uh, for corn growing and Henry C. Wallace with Wallace as farmer. Uh, he would become Secretary of Agriculture, but when he created the Wallace Corn Trophy that's in that image, uh, he was uh, <clears throat> still editing Wallace's Farmer, uh, mostly out of Des Moines. And so uh, that's a, a, a good piece, uh, or it was connected to Wallace's Farmer. He was also part of the Iowa State College of Agriculture faculty, and then would have a son, Henry A. Wallace, who'd go on to be Secretary of Agriculture as well. Uh, there's a medical kit. Uh, from Iowa's University of Iowa's first uh, black man to get a medical degree. There's a women's suffrage sash and, and some other women's suffrage material, uh, as well as some, some other material. And I do want to talk a little bit more about that honor roll from the uh, first colored or from the uh, black soldiers from Iowa serving in World War I. It's an important story connected to our state because Des Moines, of course, hosts the black officers and the medical officers training corps at Fort Des Moines. And so on the right side of that list, list some of those officers, including uh, James B. Morris, who was a black man from Georgia by birth, goes to Howard University and gets uh, training in law, becomes a lawyer in Des Moines, becomes a publisher of the black newspaper in Des Moines, The Bystander, after World War I. Uh, there are men on the left side who are the enlisted men, and you have men like Wayne Miner, who was from a mining family in Centerville area, so Appanoose County, South Central Iowa. And on November 11th, 1918, uh, Wayne Miner with his regiment was sent out on a mission. They knew the war was ending that day, but some soldiers were still sent out and he was shot and died of his wounds. And so, you have stories of, of men who were serving until the very end of that war, and one of them uh, gives his life for our nation on, its, on the very last day of the war of uh, World War I or the Great War as they knew it. And so uh, we've actually done research on all the names. There's about 150 total names there. And so I have some other stories that we know about uh, black soldiers uh, serving on behalf of Iowa in, in World War I. We also have uh, Merle Hayes service banner in that section. Like I said, Merle Hay, I meant Edward Fleur, excuse me, Edward Fleur, uh, an officer from Polk County who uh, the road that runs from downtown Des Moines to the airport, Fleur Drive is named in his honor. And we have some uh, material from women who served in World War II in that section as well. The optimism and crisis section uh, talks about the space race, then the ongoing search for equal rights, primarily for women and also the farm crisis. And so in that section, we uh, address the uh, story of Justice Linda Newman. She's a Coloradan by birth, but uh, her husband was from the Quad Cities area, uh, Davenport, Eastern Iowa, had gone to Colorado Law School where he met uh, future Justice Newman. She moved back to Iowa with him. They had uh, a law firm, she moved her way up to be a district judge. And then in 1985, I believe is the year, uh, then Governor Branstad appointed her as the uh, one of the, she was one of the candidates and Governor Branstad uh, identified her and appointed her to the Iowa Supreme Court. So she donated some things to us a few years ago. And so privileged to have that. The gavel and the plaque of Iowa that's below that was used by Lieutenant Governor Zimmerman, Joanne Zimmerman, who was the first woman to serve in the Lieutenant Governor role. Uh, it was when Iowa was still allowing split tickets on Governor and Lieutenant Governor. So in Governor Branstad's, I think it was his second term uh, when he was elected in 1986, uh, Lieutenant Governor Zimmerman was elected and she uh, uh, used that gavel and the plaque as she presided over the Senate as was her role at that time. So. Uh, pleased to have that. And then another piece to highlight uh, is connected to women's athletics. And of course, Title IX was passed as part of uh, Education Act. 
uh, in the early 1970s, 1972, summer of 72. And women's athletics was still not recognized as an important part of most universities at the time. And so a young woman who'd grown up in central Iowa, Jean Robinson, ran track in high school, went to Iowa State. They had a women's track club. She signed up, but they didn't uh, provide uniforms. So her mother sewed Jean's uh, athletic top that said Iowa State on the front and Robinson on the back, and a pair of Iowa State shorts that her mother sewed. And those are in our mobile museum, but this is her warm up jacket that her mother sewed for her in 1972. So just thinking about how equality has uh, been guaranteed for women in a greater way in athletics. Um, perhaps based on some rulings against University of Iowa, you could make the argument that maybe equality is still not totally there, uh, but this was the beginnings of, of some of that. So uh, donated in 2019 to us in a, a real compelling story about what parents will do to support their children and what uh, young women were doing to try to have equal opportunities in the 1970s. Then in the Iowa in a global world section, uh, some of the images, of course, are uh, ethanol and biofuel plants that we show. Realized I, I hadn't been emphasizing my images quite as well. Uh, a group of immigrants from Sudan on that lower image and a uh, trade mission to China in the upper image on the, the panel. And of course, talking about floods uh, across our state, uh, especially from 1993 up until uh, 2019, really and also then discussing immigration to our state and uh, renewable fuels or green energy. And so in the green energy section, we chose to highlight uh, stories connected to eth ethanol, which really does start in the late seventies, but takes off in the eighties uh, through the farm crisis uh, as a way to generate more revenue for farmers. And then a hard hat from the Iowa Lakes Community College up in Emmitsburg, North Central Iowa, the first junior college to have a program in wind turbine uh, maintenance. And so uh, good artifact to represent the rise of wind power in our state as well and, and connects to that story about the economic opportunities. And so those are really some of the uh, objects. And again, couldn't talk about everything that's you know, in the display but that connect to themes of why people come to Iowa. Usually it's because there is economic opportunity better than where they are. So those, uh, what we would call pull factors uh, as historians, and then uh, stories about equality that are important with uh, our state motto being our, our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain and how equality has uh, been offered and, and sometimes not met wholly in what has been done to try to achieve equality. And then also stories just about everyday life and uh, what we thought was important, uh, but also that have larger resonance. Uh, and so to many of us, wind turbines seem like everyday items, but they're a, a big part of why some businesses choose to locate in Iowa and also uh, a means of employment and just thinking of, you know, this is October of 2020 is we're recording this and hearing news this week that the wind turbine plant in Newton is looking at, at some layoffs and the challenges that uh, we still have. And so uh, knowing that there are lots of issues connected to stories and that takes us to the last few artifacts that I wanted to highlight. We do have things from 2020 uh, in the exhibit. We don't have any 2021 artifacts yet, but uh, an egg carton that came from a high V in central Iowa where the farm family, the Amish family down in Bloomfield in Southeast kind of uh, Southern Iowa, uh, put in a photocopied note inside their packaged uh, egg cartons that were being sold from a local grocery store in central Iowa and just saying, good morning. What a crisis we have. We have a cold morn. The girls are packing eggs every day to try and meet the needs of our stores and customers. Thank you for trying our eggs. Those of you who haven't gotten ours before now, we hope you will like them and want to support our small family farm. Big thank you and then it lists dad, mom and, and the members of the family down in Bloomfield. So that family of Amish farmers acknowledging what was happening. And then up in Osage, uh, Fox River Socks, I'm not paid to endorse them. They make really good socks, I'm told. Uh, they were making 
uh, copper infused masks and those sold quite well through March and April of 2020. As their sales were tailing off, they still were selling some of them, but they had some extra. And so their plant manager offered to donate a few of those. So we're pleased to have that. And then we also addressed some of the social uprisings of 2020 and of all the places where you think there might be a protest movement. Spencer, Iowa, up in North West Iowa has a very small black community and one of the young men who'd grown up in the town uh, now in his late 20s, so I should say a man, uh, was one of the few black people in town and, and some other folks in O'Brien County who were black uh, coordinated a, a rally in Spencer in June of 2020. And so we were able to acquire some signs connected to uh, the social justice movements. Brock Storm, who's a white man and grew up in Spencer and was a friend of Ty Jackson, sorry, I didn't say Mr. Jackson's name to start, uh, is an artist. And so he designed a poster that was popular uh, up in, in Spencer and Clay County. And so we do have some things connected to the social justice rally. I want to just finish off by talking about some of the other things. If you want to see the exhibit virtually, we do have uh, a display function, Iowa's people and places. Go to iowaculture.gov slash Iowa 175 and look for the virtual exhibit. It takes a little getting used to, but you can navigate your way by clicking on either the walls or there will be uh, little highlighted pins or dots that will tell you more about the artifact. So if you want to experiment and explore, I would encourage you to check out the Iowa People and Places exhibit uh, virtually on our website under the Iowa 175 exhibit section. And we just published this month uh, a special edition of the Annals of Iowa that talks all about Iowa history, some really great essays. And Andrew Klump, who's our editor, worked really hard on that, has some really great essays from historians across the state. Uh, if you go to the 175 page, you can uh, click on the Annals link and learn how to uh, order your own copy of that. And then didn't want to disappoint you. I know I kind of glossed over the Mildred Pelzer map and just wanted you to know that in Audubon County, what they chose to highlight below uh, Audubon and being the county seat, because it lists every courthouse, county seat, and uh, county name, it mentions, and getting first uh, mentioned, are the Danes and Germans uh, coming to Audubon County in the 1860s. So, uh, I usually lead with this. My last name's Landis, but my grandfather uh, was Christian Peter Sorensen with an E, so the right kind of Sorensen. Uh, take a lot of pride in my own Danish heritage and uh, thinking of Iowa as a place to make a good life. And that's what uh, we were talking about. And so uh, it's been great to be with you today. And thanks to Dia again and to Tova and everyone at the Museum of Danish America. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And if you ever need to reach me, uh, you can contact me most easily at leo.landis at iowa.gov. Thank you so much for your time.